so uh, uh, we're into our last session of the day. We covered uh, genomic ranges, so genomic intervals, bed files, how we handle them in R. We've looked at how we can do genomic scores, how we can take big wigs, so we don't just have where in the genome it is, we have where in the genome and some score. And in our final session for today, we're going to cover a really obviously essential part, and that is genomic features. So these are things like gene models, uh, transcripts, how these are arranged in the genome. <clears throat> so we've seen genomic features earlier on um, stored as either a GTF or a GFF file. Here we have GFF version 3. Um, and these are important because they contain information on chromosome start end, just like a bed file, source, type. This is an exon, strand. I think there's a name and a score here somewhere. But what makes these distinct from your standard bed file is that they have, importantly, this column here, which links ID, exon here to gene, feature, right, range feature to meta feature. Okay, and often for say genes and exons, we want to go a little bit beyond just counting signal within an individual exon. We want to be able to summarize the total signal in the gene. So files like this, which maintain this relationship, are very important in genomics. In GTF and GFF, they're the format which really contains this. So like I just said, we'll often find gene models as GFF, GTF. In fact, I would say universally, you will find gene models in GFF or GTF. If you're going to go download your GenCode uh, latest gene models for HG38, it will be an option of one of these two. Right, probably both they'll give you the option of. This is important, essential, because it allows us to assess or assign exons to transcripts and transcripts to genes. Right, And when we're going to do gene expression, we don't care so much about exons. We really want to know what was the total change in expression over a gene. Maybe we want to know um, <clears throat> which transcript changed more than other transcripts for a gene. Right? So this relationship is important for us. We've actually seen ourselves summarizing genome signal using bigwigs. That makes it kind of straightforward. It gets a little more complex when we want to use genes and transcripts expression. We need to assign uniquely to one transcript over another or an exon over another. So it can get a bit more complex. We also use GTFs and GFFs in IGB. Okay, so when we see this track at the bottom here, I think G, um, IGB comes with like these built-in gene models, but if you import your own GTF and you review this in IGB, you'll see it looks like this, right? And it connects, uh, maybe we haven't, we're gonna to come to this, but it connects exons together by lines because it knows that all these exons belong to the same transcript. And then it knows that all these transcripts belong to the same gene. So as I said, it is the most common format. It's not perhaps, it definitely is the most common format for gene models. Um, in this example, I have provided just a little taste of a GTF in our data directory. Um, and you can see it's like I said in our first lectures yesterday, it's just a text file. Um, and this is the model for a single gene. This is a XKR4. But when I keep saying gene models, this is how we store gene model. I want to show you at least what is one gene model. Okay. So I guess this is working from the bottom to the top here. It's probably uh, on the negative strand. Here it is, negative strand. Okay. And we have components for exons, right? So these are important parts of the gene. These are gene, the, the parts of the transcript or gene where we may see um, signal from RNA-seq. But we also have, in addition to exon, we also have CDS, right? So this is coding regions. And we have a stop and a start codon as well, right? Telling us where it's going to be translated from and what part is translated. Actually, I think we start pretty much at the beginning, right? Um, yeah. And then I think we have a little bit untranslated at the end. 
Okay. Aside from this first bit here, we also have the gene ID, the gene name. We have a transcript ID. I think in this case, they're all the same transcript. Um, but this is what we need just to represent one gene model. And if we take that, and I think you can do that with that GTF, and you import that into IGV, it will take that information. We can't quite see here, but it connects all the exons together with these lines. And if you look here, it's kind of hard to see, but there's like a thick bar um, block and a thinner block. The thick block would be um, the translated regions. And that thin block is the exon which wasn't part of the coding region, right, the CDS. So if we look, the CDS stops around here, um, here, but actually we have quite a lot more exon after that. And that's what's here, this untranslated region. So IGV takes all that information across all the genes, and this is how it displays it. So we want GTFs. We want to use them both to hold the models, which we're going to use in our analysis, but also it's nice to be able to manipulate them because then we can send them back out to IGV and we can review what we're actually counting over, summarizing over. Watch out. Uh, CDS. Did I explain that now, Jean Nicole? Maybe I didn't see your question come in. So one is your coding regions, and one is your exons. So that's coding and uncoding. It's like your entire uh, where your actual transcript would be expressed over. Um, actually, as we looked, the CDS didn't quite match up, right? So the CDS stopped before the exon, right? Whereas these were all perfect. So this last CDS stopped before the end of the gene. And it has then just an additional bit of exon, right? So from here to there, but from here to here was the exon. So there was an additional bit which wasn't CDS. So this is untranslated. Great, great, yes, no, it's important because as you see, it reflects here. And then later on, we're gonna be able to extract them differentially. We can extract the CDS or we can extract the exon. CDS is very important for things like ribosome profiling, right? Maybe you don't expect it to be on all the untranslated bits. So in a bioconductor, like we had for BS genome objects, um, we had the whole sequence stored in them. We now have these TXDB objects, these transcript database objects, and these are fantastic because they hold within them um, the transcript database, um, but they have for every species, so here Homo sapiens, we have the full transcript models. We don't need to necessarily download a GTF and import it into R. We have version controlled TXDB um, transcript databases for most model organisms and some, I was trying to scroll down the bioconductor page, I'm sorry. You gotta remember it's a slide set. Um, most model organisms are here. Okay. Like, because this has um, got major and minor revisions, right, we're going to have species, it's going to be Homo sapiens, source, UCSC, um, the major version, so this is the important HD19 here, it could have been HD38, and then this is the table in UCSC where we're actually going to get this information from. And I think I'm going to come to that and show you the actual table itself later on. Okay. We can also make use of our own GTFs and GFFs. And you know, the transcript models in Bioconductor I like a lot, but some people will want to use your own GTF. Um, clearly, you've already been doing the analysis maybe before you came to Bioconductor. Maybe someone says, this is the genome of interest. Maybe you're not working on a model organism. You're working in Mosquito, um, and there isn't a Bioconductor TXDB for you. But you can read them in very easily into a format which is um, you know, perfect for doing those types of operations using this genomic features package, right? So the genomic features package has methods to import GTF and GFF straight into this TXDB object, um, but it also contains, like GRanges, the functions, the abilities, the methods to allow you to operate on these um, TXDB objects too. Okay. So first thing we're going to look at is actually pre-built annotations. So we're going to take the uh, TXDB for HG19. 
as usual, if you want to install any package in Bioconductor, you take the name, you Google it. Um, it will take you to the page. You go to the page, and there is always this installation. It's the great things about Bioconductor, very uniform. Once we've got that installed, we can just load that library. And like with BS Genome, we automatically get an object put into our R session, our R environment, the same name as the library. So I'm going to quickly run that in my R. If I can find my R. Here we go. That's not the R I was using. OK, so if I do this, hopefully that's OK. I can then have this object available to me, and I can just type it in. OK, I think the next slide is going to say exactly what I was going to say here. Oh, no. So yeah, once loaded, this is now brought into the environment. If I look at the class, it's going to tell me it's a TXDB object from the genomic features package. So we can already see the relationship. And then what's nice, like with BS Genome, when we typed it in, it actually gave us by default this display. Okay, So it tells us the object, but it tells us the source. We could have worked that out from here. It tells us the genome again. We could have worked that out. The table there. But now it gives us a little bit more information. It actually told us when it was retrieved. Great, 2015. So this is a old genome. So it doesn't make it makes sense that that's kind of old. But also some summary: how many CBS rows, exon rows, transcripts, all these things we had in the GTF. It's containing within this TXDB object, and it gives us a little summary here. Uh, GRC 37 is the same as HG19. Uh, as suggested in the name, TXDBs are databases containing the information we would have in a GTF. I just said this. Um, to access information, we're going to need to use special accessor functions. This is a new kind of object to us. It is a DB. It's a database. Um, by using these accessors, though, we're going to start to get back formats we understand and we already have been working with, such as G-ranges. This is a great format. I told you it's going to be popping up everywhere. We're going to see flavors of this. Once we've extracted the information using these accessors from here, we can just do everything we did in G-Ranges. Right? We just need to know the rules for extracting this information. Um, and they are pretty straightforward, really. I'm going to step through them now. But if we want to get the gene information, we use the genes function on our TXDB object, and it's going to return a G-Ranges of gene locations. Same for transcripts, same for exons, same for CDSs, same for promoters. But remember, promoters weren't in our, <clears throat> our um, GTF, right? So we're going to have to construct the promoter information using something else in the GTF. So we can just see this in action now. Sorry, this has gone a little bit off the bottom because of this. But if we do genes on our TXDB object, we get back a G ranges and we have a value for every gene, right? So we have 23,000 ranges here. We have one metadata column, which is our gene ID. And this is entrees ID. So this is going to be, I think, one's alpha globulin or something, human alpha globulin. Um, and then again, we have the IDs here as well. So we have them both by name. So we can just do a standard index. If I want 100, I can just index by that. But we also have it here, and we have our strand information. So everything we need. We can do the same with exons, right? We just do exons on our TXDB object. And now we get all the exons, and there is a ton of them, 28,000, no, 280 something thousand. Um, same information. The only thing we're going to get now is an exon ID. And typically, this won't be in a GTF, like an exon ID. It's a, not a common not a common feature to have in there but it will fill it in one until the end of the numbers so here it's just the row number and we have no ids here either because we're making this id up internally if we want to get transcripts we're going to use transcripts we give it this again and now it's going to give us the tx id again this is made up by it and the tx name okay so these are ucsc ids and we could go look that up. It's going to go take us to whatever UCSA gene it is. And again, these are all G ranges 
we know how to operate on these. CDS, exactly the same again. We just do CDS on this TXDB object and we get our CDS object back. Remember, these are just the coding regions. So these aren't the full exons for RNA-seq. You really would expect signal across the whole thing. But if you want to know just the coding regions, you can extract it this way. Right, so we actually might want to get a little bit more information back there and we can. Um, here we're always doing the defaults, we're just doing this, no parameters, no additional information. One thing which you can add to, I think, all of these exons, transcripts, CDS, genes, um, is some additional columns you would want to bring down. Okay, so in this case, we can see the full list of available columns and we'll hop into R to see there. But I just want to specify that, you know, I wasn't too interested in transcript name, probably should be. But here I want gene ID, right? So I want to know that these transcripts belong to the same gene. Maybe I'll do some summarization. But to do that, I just need to specify columns and I can say gene ID and TX ID. And then I've got my uh, output now in my metadata columns here. So let's just see what that actually sh uh, showed us. If we do transcripts. Oops. Okay, uh, tell us the available columns. Here we go. So these are all the available columns we can get. Actually, you can't apply it to gene, but TX chrome, TX strand, uh, exon chrome, exon strand, CDS cron, CDS strand. They're not allowed for CDF, CDS. And then you can step through here and see all the details as you need. Okay. So another useful function, especially when we're going to do things like trip seek um, or maybe motif hunting, is this promoters function. So this promoters function allows us to use the information within our TXDB object to extract what would be the upstream region um, of the start of a gene. So we had our TSS we defined in our last meeting, our last session. Now we want to be able to do that straight from our TXDB. Um, we can actually do that using this promoters function. We just need to provide the gene models. And we say we want to go upstream 2000 and then downstream. So just down from the TSS 50 to include a bit of the gene. Provide that to um, run that, get our G ranges. And now we have per transcript here, the transcript and the promoter region of interest. Right. Both these transcripts start at the same position, probably have different endings or different exons, but they both start here. So we've, so we've seen that we can do this for G ranges using resize. But again, if you want to save yourself the hassle of re importing this, re resizing around the TSS before you do these extension extensions, Promoters does that all for you. Okay. So this has all been very simple at the moment. Um, we've had just genes, um, tr exons, transcripts, and we've got back our G ranges. Okay. But we saw at the beginning what was really great about a GTF is that it has this kind of feature exon to meta feature gene or transcript. It can maintain that relationship. Right. So we want to be able to pull out our transcripts X on CDS grouped by the transcript they belong to or the gene they belong to. Okay. So we're going to then use this exons by CDS by and transcripts by to extract lists of G ranges, cleverly called a G ranges list. And each element of this list contains the features um, which belong to the meta feature. Okay. So we will have, for instance, by transcripts by, we're going to pull out all the transcripts as a G ranges for one gene. And that will be one element in our long G ranges list, which contains all the genes. Okay, so we can see that in action here. If I do transcripts by, and I can specify um, what I want to do it by here, here I want to do it by gene. I'm going to say the TXDB object we're working on. And this is then going to give me back now a G ranges list object. And this is like a, 
um, we saw RLE and RLE list, right? This is just a special form of a list in order to handle G ranges. It allows us to do slightly better things than if we just had a list of G ranges. But the default is going to give us back, so we don't even have to worry about it. And you can see the first element is named one. This was our alpha globulin gene. And these are the G ranges, the transcripts, which were part of that gene. Right? Both these things belong to this gene. And then we have gene 10 here. This is another entrees ID for another gene. And we would have the transcripts which belong to that gene. There. Okay. So now we would have a G ranges list of length of all the genes here. And in each element would be all the transcripts which belong to it. If we wanted to extract a G from a G ranges list, we can operate on it just like a standard list. We just do dollar or our square brackets and we can do, oh, sheesh. Sorry. And we can do, um, yeah, dollar or our double square brackets, just like we could a normal list in base R. And here, if I want to extract the first element, I can just do one. And it's going to give me that for the alpha globulin gene. Similarly, a very useful exons by function. Um, we can use the by argument. So by here can either be a gene or a transcript. So we want to group exons by their transcript now. We don't write in transcript, we use TX here. So TX seems to be the shorthand for transcript. So in this case, we're going to get an exon for every transcript. And here it's going to name them actually by the transcript ID. Right, so we had transcript IDs here, which is one to the number of transcripts. Okay, so cool. And then we get the exon ID, we get the exon rank. This is actually the position within the gene. So there are probably two exons which were missing from this transcript. So it was one, three, five, but the rank is one, two, three within this particular uh, transcript, the rank of the exons. <laughs> So often we have our favorite gene models, like I was saying, we could be wanting to use gen code, we could be wanting to just import directly from our database of interest. They're not going to be necessarily stored in our TXDB objects, um, but we still want to get all the functionality of these TXDB objects. We still want to be able to use exons by, we still want to extract the gene information. So we can actually use functions like make txdb from gff as similarly uh, make txb db from lots of other types of formats but this is one of the most common ones and this is going to parse either a gtf or a gff straight into your uh, txdb object we don't need to specify the format because it's going to look at the actual end it's going to look and see if uh, do i see a gtf or a gff as the extension we just run this function on our object and then we'll get back our txdb object just as if we'd imported this from uh, a txdb pre-built by conductor package okay now we look and it says the data source it was from the directory data slash whatever but we don't have much information on terms of organism taxonomy id or any of this we haven't told it the genome but it does tell us the number of transcripts. Remember, we just put in one and it tells us, importantly, the creation time, right? So we actually know when we build this. Now we have our own GTF object um, as a Janai TXDB um, internal object. We can start to do all the things we wanted to do. Genes on this will now return this XKR as the name because it was the gene ID. And it gives us the chromosome and the start of the gene and the end of the gene. Okay. Similarly, we can do things now like exons by, and then it will go in to that GTF we actually reviewed, looked at in slides, and it will then bring out the um, grouped by gene here, exons by gene. So we have the gene name here, and then we have the exons which belong to that here. If I'd done CDS by, I would get a slightly different uh, G ranges back because we saw that this last exon was a little bit untranslated. It would be a little different, but the same format. A really nice feature of um, 
these objects is this things like mate txb from ucsc they also have a mate txdb from biomart i'm not sure if we're going to cover that in this session perhaps it's my next slides or something nope um that's another repository for where you can download these gene models so actually it's, they make it very easy to do this and this is because this is how they build as we saw our TXDB object came from UCSC. They themselves write these functions so that they can just update and make these TXDB objects easily. So we can just use this function to build our own TXDB, but first we need to know what genomes are actually available in us for us in UCSC. The R track layer package has some nice ways of interacting with UCSC. In fact, I really think that's where the R track layer package was born, interacting with UCSC. Remember, bigwigs at UCSC, BED, I think, were originally defined by them too. Um, so we can just use this function. No arguments needed. It's just going to go query the um, database and it's going to go give us back a table. And then that table will have the DB name, the species, the date and the kind of longer name, something we would be able to read. Okay, but it's this information here we really need because when we want to go run this function, make TB, TXDB from UCSC, we just need to specify the genome we actually want to build from. And it goes up and it queries this database itself, finds the location, brings down the gene models from their database and then builds us this here. Okay, so even though this may have you know, we know that HG18, we're on HG38 now, but it was HG18, HG19, HG38. So it's two releases behind, maybe 15 years old. So it's not going to be new data, but even though it tells us now when we've actually created it, um, how it was created using this, and then it fills in a little bit more of this information, right? So it knows what that would be through doing it through this mechanism. And again, we can use the same functions on this TXDB object, just like it was taken from our more standard TXDB pre-built annotation databases. And here I'm just going to look 2000 upstream, 50 base pairs into the gene. And that would give me my HG38, HG18 promoters here. So something which is going to be super useful is that once you've messed around or once you've created your GTF, maybe once you've got them from these TXDB objects, right? You want to export them so you can actually look at them in something like ITB. And maybe you subset to just your gene of interest and then you want to export it to ITB. So we can use the export GFF uh, function here from the R track layer package. So we had export bed, we had export DW. Now we have export.gff. And we just need to specify here the actual format. It doesn't seem to quite work. I might be wrong now, but by specifying the actual extension, it doesn't seem to always want to give you the right format. But we're just going to do export.gff, give it our custom TXDB object we created um, from reading in this data earlier on. And then we can just write this out to this connection, custom txdbb.gff format GFF or GTF, format GTF. So we've seen that we can do things like extract transcripts and exons grouped by genes transcripts um, using these transcripts by an exponents by function. So then once we've done this, it's very easy just to get the total number of groups, total, total elements in our list, our G ranges lists, just using the length function. Okay, so if I took my exons by, if I'm going to do by gene, that means I will have an element for every gene, and in that element will be all the exons. I will have then, in total, uh, 20,000 um, elements, each one representing the entirety, sorry, in entirety representing every gene in my genome, right, in my GTF. A nice set of functions, which are both in base, but the next page will be um, particular genomic features, are extensions of length, which gives us the total number of elements in our list here, because we're doing by gene, the total number of genes. We can actually use lengths too, 
right? And length is going to go through our every element in our list, and it's going to get the number or the number of elements, the length of every element within our list. Okay, so the first um, here I'm doing exons by. So the first gene had 15 exons. The second gene, number 10, had three exons. The 100 had 12 exons. The gene called 1000 had 16 exons. So this is a nice, very quick, optimized way of counting how many elements do you have in each list. I think Matt would have shown you L apply. And you can do L apply on this, on this, and get the length. That would take a long time. Lengths is a lot faster than looping through and getting the length of every element. Something which is really important to get is transcript length, right? So this is going to be the sum. So if we go back to somewhere I can actually see, right? So this is all the exons in a gene, right? So the sum of the width of these exons is going to be your total transcript length. And total transcript length is really important because when we want to do things like summarizing um, signal over your exons in a gene, we then want to be able to normalize that to the total length of the gene. And if we can't do that, we really can't compare this gene was higher expressed than that gene in any way. Right? It's just going to be always, it's going to be biased by the length of the gene. Right? So transcript lengths from inside the genomic ranges, uh, genomic features packages, really makes this very easy for you. You can just run transcript lengths on your TXDB object. It's going to give you back a data frame. And in there, you'll have the TX ID, the TX name, the gene ID. So here we have TX IDs with no gene ID, probably non-coding. The number of exons for that transcript, and then importantly, the total transcript length. Right? So we can use this then we can either take a summary or a mean of the gene, right, if we wanted to normalize, or we could just normalize within the transcript to get things like reads per kilobase of gene. Again, we keep showing interop inter interoperability with the BS genome package, but again, TXDB um, objects work well with all the other bioconductor objects. Right? We can use G ranges with them. That's what they give us back. What's really cool, and we're going to need to use later on when we're starting to do RNA-seq analysis, is this N extract transcript sequences. Right? And you can imagine this isn't necessarily an easy task. And the same reason that you know these exons are spread out right to get the total uh, width we would have to go through get the width of this exon that exon that exon summarize it up to get the sequence under a transcript we would have to extract this bit of sequence this bit of sequence this bit of sequence and then stitch them all together to make one contiguous sequence over the transcript right because this exon and this exon are separated by at least a few hundred base pairs right? there's a gap where we have splicing so a really optimized way is this extract transcript seeks. We just load in the BS genome of interest. Here I'm going to use BS genome H sapiens UCSC H19. I can specify for transcripts my TXDB object directly, and then it goes and produces this HG9 transcript seek, right? And that contains a DNA string set. So this is what we can write a faster from and the sequence for every transcript inside that genome. As I said, we can then write this out. We want to do write X string set, take this DNA string set here, and then we'll write this out to file, my transcript.sequence.far. And if anyone uses Salmon or Callisto for RNA-seq, you know this file here is the input. It's the reference we need to start making our index and start doing our count. We're going to show that in more detail when we come to the RNA seat. We're really going to step you through how you do it, but this is the fundamentals of it. A really nice, geez, Bioconductor is so great. There's a really nice feature in Bioconductor to deal with a very common problem. And that is 
you know there are still multiple camps and there is no winning in this in this particular format war we have a ucsc style of chromosome names these will typically be chromosome one chromosome two chromosome three but for ensemble they use different chromosome names one two three four right actually not so bad i could just paste onto my chromosomes this but we know that's not going to be straightforward right seek levels are a factor sorry seek names are a factor so we would have to replace all the levels and then we would have to replace the new names equivalents right or just take out the cur in the other chromosomes like mt i think it's chromosome m in ucse mt in ensemble so just taking out the cur this chr and pasting it on or removing it to swap between them it just isn't going to work but um, a few years ago, maybe four, four or five years ago, uh, Sonali in the Bioconductor Consortium, she put together a really cool package called Genome Info and Genome Info DB. Um, oh, sorry, Genome Info DB and Genome Info DB data. Um, and these are fantastic because they allow you to do this mapping automatically. So I can map from chromosome names in UCSC to ensemble in one line. Um, such that I can actually make these comparisons in the future. So if someone else has given me some ensemble results, but I work in UCSC, I can just quickly change them in R and start to you know match up chromosome names. Before anything, we just need to load each genome info DB. I believe this will load this package. Okay, so we can re review all the mappings uh, for supported organisms using this genome styles function. Just give it no arguments, and it's going to return a vector. I guess it's a list, but it's actually a vector of um, mappings, how it or what mappings it has available for the different uh, organisms. So here we're going to do all mappings. I'm going to give genome styles, and I can see the names here. Maybe I could see if I've actually got this loaded in my own R. That's the wrong R. That's the right R. Uh, Lots of things. Little species. What's that do? Okay. Oh, well, lots of species available now. Uh, what was the genome? What was the command I was actually using there? Boop, boop, boop. Oh, genome styles. Let's try this. Perfect. So here it's got. Uh, if we do the names. Can see it's got um, all the different organisms it supports and it's not really, not a lot of organisms it supports but the ones which we commonly have problems with mouse and homo sapiens rat drosophila you know mapping across the different annotations to these is a real pain and you can see if i just focus on maybe the one for uh, homo sapiens you can see it has a map here so if I'm using NCBI, this is the naming scheme. Uh, if I'm using Ensemble, this is the naming scheme. If I'm using UCSC, this is the naming scheme. And you can see it's this MTM, which is a bit of a pain. But if I'm using DBSNP, they don't bother with the R and they do the MT. Right. Also, it gives you information on whether or not it's a sex chromosome or a circular chromosome, which is useful to you. Okay. So those mappings we can have a look um, and here I just want to know what names you know so what organisms are available to me what species are available to me um, like I just showed you we just looked at this we came and did all mappings and I subset it doing the dollar to homo sapiens because this all mappings is just a list of data frames um, and we saw exactly this right it contains information on whether it's circular autosomal uh, a sex chromosome, and then what the name of these chromosomes would be in NCBI, UCSC, DBSNP, or ensemble. So the seek level style function actually allows us to review the naming convention for really any genomic ranges or TBX, TXDB object. So I think because this is made up of genomic ranges, we can apply it. So first thing we can do is get the genes from our TXDB object, UCSC HD19 no gene. We get our G ranges of genes, um, and then we can do our seek level style on them. 
and it's going to tell you it's UCSC. So I can't, it's kind of just gone off the bottom of the page a bit, so I'll just do that here myself too. Levels, oops, levels file, and then I can do my genes. Right, and it's UCSC, which is you know not unsurprising considering. We downloaded it from the UCSC TXDB, or they downloaded it from the UCSC genome tables. Okay, so that's straightforward. What's really great is that just to update, change all this to a new um, style, all I need to do is rather than use seek level style to tell me what it is, I can use it to assign a new style. So in this case, we have this here. If I want to assign ensemble, it should be, but it's now updated all my seek names. It's updated that chromosome M to MT, right? And it did it without me worrying about messing up my levels or something not quite being right. Did it in one line for us. I think it's a really cool package. It just allows you to be able to still take advantage of other people's annotations or other people giving you data, which is just in a different chromosome naming convention. So I think the final slides here, we're going to look at um, additional ways of doing annotation. Um, because we've been looking at transcript annotation, and this contains all the information on uh, where a gene is, uh, and the gene model. So there's a lot of information in here. So alongside the TXDB packages, probably way before the TXDB packages came along, we had these org DB packages. So I talked about these uh, just the other day, um, but we'll have an org DB package for different species, but we won't have them for different genome builds, right? A gene name stays the same irrespective of genome builds. That may not be true with all the updates to genome names now, um, but they're certainly not accounting for revisions, major revisions in gene names here. So we have org, it's going to be the species HS. It'll be the ID type. Most of bioconductor DB packages are EG, so Entrez gene. If you've got, they do have some mosquito hair. I think they use vector base IDs. If you use Drosophila, I think they use fly base IDs. Here we have, ah, and then it's just the DB. So again, like every package, if you want to install it, we can just Google this. But most of the time, it's going to be BioC Manager install and then this package. No harm in just Googling it and then downloading it. We can load this. And like the TXDB objects, like the BS genome objects, we get a object brought into our current environment. And that object contains the database. Right. So this is the org DB. And it comes from a package we haven't messed around with yet, which is annotation DB. Okay, annotation database interface. As with TXDB packages though, this isn't a data frame. We can't just select columns like that. It is a database internally. So we need to have special accessor functions to retrieve information from it. And we have really the most useful function is select, right? So this is gonna retrieve annotation data as a data frame based on some keys that we supply based on telling them what type this key was, it's a particular type of ID, and telling it what information I want to get back. Okay. But we need to know keys, key types, and columns, so we can extract what columns are available to us. We can extract what key types are available to us. Um, and we can also get all the keys in the database, right? what keys they have available. Okay, so we're actually going to go through and try and use this in action. If we apply the columns to our org hseg.db, we can see already all the information we would have by gene. We have things like the ensemble ID, various annotation, uh, PFAM, path is going to be keg, ontology, prosite. So functional annotation and also lots of different IDs for this particular gene. Go, go all, that's very important. Okay. If we want to know more about any of these identifiers, you can just do help. 
and then one of these things and it will bring out the um, information about this go what it is or what evidence means or what PFAM means. We can do that in a few slides. Um, we also see what key types we have available to us, right? So this is the information we can get back. But what information can we provide? Well, we can provide, you know, IDs as symbol. We can provide IDs as refseq. We could provide path keg IDs. Um, uh, most importantly, we can provide entrees IDs. So we know we have entrees IDs everywhere. This is here. Okay. Finally. We can look at all the keys available for us. So if we say keys, we give it the org we're working with. I tell it I want to see all the keys associated to the symbol key type. And then it just gives me uh, here, just the first 10, uh, a vector of um, all the symbols within this database here. What we are most likely going to use this for is to try and add, we have things like entrees IDs, we want to be able to add more information to our IDs, right? Maybe we want to add gene ontology, maybe we just want to put a symbol because it's saying 110, 101 is useless to us, but saying alpha globulin, you know, med one, uh, cyclin two, those are really useful to us, right? So this select function is, um, what we want to use to do that. So we use select, we give us, or we give it the org.hs.db we want to work on, right? We've looked up what key types and what columns are available to us. Okay, so we know I'm going to supply uh, symbols as my key type, and I'm going to give it this symbol, A1BG, and I ask back in the columns for the symbol, the gene name and the chromosome, and then it gives me back the symbol, the gene name, and the chromosome. Okay, so now we can use this for actually what, if you're using R and you're using Bioconductor, what you're going to use it for most of the time. We can get our gene locations from genes, right? We use this for our TXDB object. And earlier on, we saw it gave us uh, a nice G ranges back with row names, or sorry, names as the entrees IDs, but also this gene ID column. Nice, right, so we have the ID as an entrees ID on either side. But we couldn't argue that this is particularly useful unless you know your ID of your favorite gene. So we can actually here extract the IDs um, from this column. So I'm using just a dollar and I'm extracting from the metadata columns the gene ID. I could be taking the names as well. And then I'm going to go select from org.hs.egd. These IDs, right? So it's going to give it the IDs in that order from here. And then I'm going to say these are the key type. These were entrees ID because they were entrees ID. We know that because when we read them in, it was TXDB, uh, whatever, UCSC entrees ID or something. Uh, and then we have columns, which we want to get back. I want to get the symbol back. I want to get the gene name back. And it's going to give me back the entrees ID. All right, so now uh, oh, it's not alpha globulin, it's alpha 1 glycoprotein. Mm, I was wrong. So now I can see that I was wrong about what my entrees gene ID was, and I can see the symbol, and I can see this. Okay. So once you've produced your table of results, if you have entrees IDs, you're going to apply this to it, right? Extract the ID column with the entrees IDs in order to get something slightly more useful to annotate your results. So I think that's the end of the sessions for today. Um, we have perhaps a poll popping up at some point. Oh, actually, I do have a poll button. Well, maybe we don't. But what we certainly have is some exercises, um, and these are working with gene models. But also, we're going to start to use, I think, various combinations of what we learned so far. All right. So if you want to work through this, um, I will come back in roughly around half an hour, so maybe just 3.45, um, and I can review this with you, and we can go through the results then. If you wanted to cut the corner, you can also just skip to the results here. Um, but I advise giving yourself time just to look through the exercises. You'll get a, a really nice understanding. 
Okay, guys. Okay, slightly smaller room, so I'm just going to run through quickly here um, inside our uh, document. <clears throat> so if we look, we have first question, load the library txdb uh, UCSC MM10 known gene. It's very straightforward, just library txdb. Give it the actual name of the library and it's going to load it. Straight away, if we want to be able to get the number of genes, if we want to get the number of transcripts, probably we could have actually just, I think it even just displays it inside R. But we can also extract G ranges of all the genes and we can use our standard length. And that will give us the number of rows in our G ranges. In this case, that represents the number of genes. We then have transcripts, so we can use transcripts um, also on this and we'll get the number of, we'll get a G ranges of all the transcripts and if we use length and we'll get a transcript. Okay. Plot the distribution of log 10 gene lengths as on genome. So this is important when we get this genes out, they actually haven't got any exons in, right? So we're just seeing the limits, the beginning of the first exon to the very end of the last exon. Uh, gene lengths also selected chromosomes as density using ggplot2. Right? So I think we just need to extract a G ranges of the genes here. We're going to make them into a data frame here, and that's going to be important because we're going to use ggplot. And then we'll do gene table, gene table seek names, um, and we'll do this chromosome here. And this will just subset our data frame now by the seat names column just to give us those in these three chromosomes. We have with every G ranges we get width, right? So we're going to use ggplot, pass it this table. We will tell it use the um, width for the density plot and then make us fill. Basically, it's going to split across uh, uh, rows here by the different chromosomes, the seat names. Do a density. I'm going to make it log x uh, 10. I think I said that in the description, log 10 gene lengths. So I don't need to change the actual data. I can just change the scale. Facet grid by seat names, minimal um, scale fill discrete. Right? So I'm actually going to fill the scale here and I just wanted to change the name to be chromosome. Okay, so the same kind of thing we do a lot is we're going to take our G ranges going to turn it into a data frame just so we can do a bit of visualizing in ggplot. Retrieve the log 10 transcript lengths. So we needed to get uh, the transcripts first and then I can turn that into a data frame and then I can just select only those on chromosome one. Okay. I'm then going to use this function um, tx, sorry, transcript lengths which we saw earlier on and that gives us this nice table if I stop and just share my desktop. I think I've got all these loaded anyway. So we can just copy and paste this into our browser. Oop, let's do it here so we can break it out a bit. So we get all the transcripts here. The transcripts. Oh, I need to load that first. The library. Okay, now it's loaded. I can get all the transcripts and then I can turn this into a data frame, right, which is the same information, but now in something we can put in ggplot. I'm going to use the seat names column to subset down to chromosome one. And then I can use this cool function transcript lengths. It's going to take a few seconds because it is doing a lot of work under the hood. But then that gives me this data frame for every transcript. I have the gene ID had a gene ID, the number of exons and the total length. I can then merge. So if we look at this table here, we had transcript name here. I also have transcript name in my txd lengths data frame. And I could just merge them together by that column, just keeping the ones which I had in both. So I get this data frame. And now I can plot things like the width, the transcript length, the number of exons, my GG plot here. Okay, I guess all that really shows me is that you're always going to be wider uh, than the sum of your exons, right? Or maybe the same. 
Okay, I think I'm still sharing my screen. Um, I'm gonna just make sure I am. Okay, so plot the nucleotide content for the longest transcript. Okay, so we're just gonna combine our things together. We're gonna to take our TXDB object, we're gonna extract the transcripts. All right, so we're gonna get our G ranges of transcripts. I'm gonna get the region of interest to me and I'll create that in the G ranges here myself. I'm then gonna just find the transcripts which overlap this range and then gonna order them by the width. Right, remembering we have width, which is the distance between the start and the end. And then I can just extract the longest transcript because I'm doing decreasing equals true. It will be the first in my ordered G ranges. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Okay. Now I can start to do the sequence stuff. I can take the library, the BS genome. I can extract transcript sequences um, of the BS genome uh, using the TXDB. And then I will subset my uh, DNA string set by the name of the longest transcript ID. And then I can use alphabet frequency on this, extract the alphabet frequency for the data frame, the parts of interest, A, T, G, C, and G, and then make this into a data frame and do a little GG plot. Gosh, that's a lot of stuff we did in that one little thing. Let's just step that through, um, up until that GG plot anyway. So we take the transcripts. Okay, we take our range, my ranges. We then subset these transcripts by this other range. So that should have only given us a few, 16 or whatever. Oh, 16. Then going to order it by the width. Okay, so we can actually look at the width that we can extract here. We use that to order. And that gave us our ordered one here where they should now be going from uh, wider to smaller. This is a really wide one. And then now with that, I load the BS genome object. I can extract the transcript sequences for here. Ooh, transcripts. And now I have the, oh, it's gonna take a second. Maybe a little bit longer. Once I have all these sequences, I can then just use the ID, which I got from here. Uh, this ID. Oh, here we go. So now I have my old seeks. And oh, maybe they didn't have the ID. Oh, oh, oh. oh longest was there. Okay. Uh, transcript ID here. And then I can now have my DNA string set. I can now apply alphabet frequency to this, put that into a vector, and then get just the alphabet, um, the frequency of the particular bases I want, and create my data frame. And then from that data frame, like we've done before, we made a ggplot. Right? Once it's a data frame, easy to pass that into ggplot. Read in the gene expression table. Okay, so we have an expression table. We read this in. Um, great. Okay, this is actually kind of interesting. So we're going to read in this gene expression table. I'm going to share my desktop again. <laughs> we have our gene expression table. Um, and now I'm going to try and add some additional annotation to this. Okay, so that was my D table there. What I'm going to do is take my D table, take the IDs turn them to a character, right? So these are all my entrees IDs. And then going to use the org hseg.db. So I'm going to use that database, database to look up these. I'm telling it it's entrees gene ID. And I'm going to get back gene name and entries ID. So I get my table like this. I think the next thing to do, which is kind of straightforward, is we just need to merge that back in with our original table containing all our results. Okay. Now we have our table, entrees, gene ID, gene name, symbol, base name, mean, log file changes. But what's really useful 
because we've now managed to add a little bit more useful information here. Okay. Identify genes with a P adjusted greater than 0 0.5, a log fold change greater than one, export promoter permissions positions of these genes, genes transcripts, merge overlapping promoters and export to a bed file. So I think we're just doing a combination of our techniques. Step this through. Um, so we have our new table and I want to get those which were less than 0 0.05 were not NA. So we had a value for the P adjusted and the log fold change was greater than one. So this will give me my true false. And then I just want to get the entrees gene IDs. So I'm just going to select that column, but subset down to just the genes where they had these changes. I'm then going to load in my txdb library for HD19. Get all the promoters right for um, the whole of the genome for HD19, upstream 2000, downstream from the TSS50. I want to bring in the gene ID column too, because I'm going to need to match by this gene ID column, right, based on the genes to select here. Now I can filter down, I can just get my selected promoters, okay, just those which were in my genes to select. And then I'm going to take these selected promoters, this G ranges, and we have 8,757 ranges. If I do reduce any overlapping promoters now, would be reduced. And I guess we had a few from the same gene, so they're probably the same transcript. And those all got collapsed now. If I want to write this to file, I can just use our export.bed, right? This is the R track layer package, give it our G ranges, tell it the connection, export.bed. And then somewhere in our working directory, which should be here, we should just be able to refresh. And we can see our dpromoters.bed here. Great. So that's the end of the session for today. I'm going to close our meeting now. Um, thank you very much for coming. For those of you who hang around at the end, um, and we will catch up with you tomorrow morning where we're going to get into fast Q alignment and some more of the uh, complexities. I'll speak to everyone then, or I'll see everyone then.